grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Today's readings are filled with a lot of practical advice. And I have to say that uh, I know you've all taken it to heart because not a single one of you has decided to sit in the front pew today. Yes, come, come forward. That's so very un-Lutheran, correct? <laughs> oh, but all joking aside, the, the words of Scripture are indeed good and useful. Uh, very practical advice that sometimes our Lord gives us, uh, but also advice that is to guide us in our, in our walk of this life, in our hands, and how we may serve the Lord, how we may offer worship of lips, of heart, and of hand. But one thing we tend to overlook at the very beginning of this gospel reading, before we get to this practical advice, is the fact that a miracle has taken place. It happens in one sentence and we just, whoosh, we blow right past it. But what takes place is actually the third healing miracle that our Lord has performed on the Sabbath. And there are those, the lawyers and the Pharisees, for whom this just rubs them the wrong way. Because what is the Sabbath but the day on which no work is to be done? And if you decide to do work on the Sabbath, then you are indeed breaking the law of God. And you should be punished. The first healing miracle, when he first, when Jesus really sort of sets off these uh, lawyers and Pharisees, takes place back in chapter 6. He heals a man with a withered hand. St. Luke has written for us, On another Sabbath he entered the synagogue and was teaching, and a man was there whose right hand was withered. And the scribes and the Pharisees watched him to see whether he would heal on the Sabbath so that they might find a reason to accuse him. But he, meaning Jesus, knew their thoughts, and he said to the man with the withered hand, Come and stand here. And he rose and stood there. And Jesus said to them, I ask you, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life, or to destroy it. And after looking around at them, all he said to him, stretch out your hand. And he did so, and his hand was restored. But they, the scribes and Pharisees, were filled with fury and discussed with one another what they might do to Jesus. The second healing miracle takes place in chapter 13 where Jesus heals a woman with a disabling spirit, meaning she could not stand aright. St. Luke records, Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And behold, there was a woman who had a disabling spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not fully straighten herself. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said to her, Woman, you are freed from your disability. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight, and she glorified God. But the ruler of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, said to the people, There are six days in which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be healed, and not on the Sabbath. Then the Lord answered him, You hypocrites! Do not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to water it? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for eighteen years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day? As he said these things, all his adversaries, the scribes and the Pharisees, were put to shame. 
and all the people rejoiced at the glorious things that were done by him. That brings us now to chapter 14, our reading today of him, A Man with Dropsy. St. Luke records, One Sabbath, when he went to dine at the house of a ruler on the f of the Pharisees, they, the scribes and Pharisees, were watching him carefully. And behold, there was a man before him who had dropsy. And Jesus responded to the lawyers and Pharisees, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent. Then he took him and healed him and sent him away. And he said to them, Which of you, having a son or an ox that has fallen into a well on a Sabbath day, will not immediately pull him out? And they could not reply to these things. Or literally, they had not the strength to contradict these things. First it was anger, then it was shame, and now, now it is silence. Is this perhaps not how you or I react when we have been found wrong? When the law has been spoken to us, at first we're angry. No, it's okay for me to do this thing. See, here everyone else is doing it. And it's really not such a bad thing. No, it, in fact, it's, it's all right. It's not as bad as these other things. We get angry and indignant that someone, namely God, or even the person who is speaking to us God's word, tells us what we've done is wrong. And if, if we have not become so secure in our sin, our conscience pricks us and says, I might, I might want to do this thing, but yes, they're right. Yes, God's Word says I shouldn't do this. And how do we feel? But ashamed. Shame that we have done this thing. Shame that we have sinned against God and against our neighbors. But again, if we are not too secure in our sin, where are we left then? No more are we trying to justify ourselves or to rationalize the wicked things we do. We are brought to silence. The flesh no longer has the strength to contradict God's Word. For once we have been brought to silence, that is the time for repentance. At first we're angry, our conscience speaks to us, and then the old Adam is drowned in contrition and repentance so that he is no longer able to speak, but the new man comes forth. This call to repentance that we hear when our flesh is silent, this call is the mission that Christ, that Christ was sent on. The reason why the Father sent His only begotten Son into our flesh was so that He could, in His own words, not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And what is this word, repentance? Literally, the, the word that Jesus uses in the Greek is metanoeo, a change of mind. But it involves also a turning, a turning of oneself with contrition, from the sin to God. Not from sin to what you're supposed to do and do right, but from the sin to God. For it is from God 
that we receive forgiveness, restoration, that we are then able to walk by His strength to do good, to do the good works the Holy Spirit has given us, guided and strengthened, not in the flesh, but strengthened in the Spirit to live according to His will, And brothers and sisters, as we have gathered here today, as we have heard the call to repentance, to receive the forgiveness of sins, let us remember the Sabbath is not merely a day of rest or the seventh day of the week. The Sabbath is the day when man rests so that God may serve him. As our Lord says in, in Mark chapter 2, the Sabbath was not made for man. Excuse me, the Sabbath was indeed made for man. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. You see, the Sabbath was made for you, that on this day you rest, you remain silent, leaning not on your own strength, but trusting in God. And so allow Him to serve you. Receive from God the blessings of forgiveness, the true body and the most precious blood of Christ Jesus given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins and the strengthening of faith. For it's not only lawful, but it's the fundamental nature of of the Sabbath, the true essence of this day, that the Lord should indeed do good, should save life, should release from sin, and should heal. So then let us come forward with true hearts, with the full assurance of faith, and with our hearts sprinkled and our bodies washed in the pure waters of holy baptism and hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering and receive from he who is faithful the precious gifts of Christ our Lord. For on this day he heals, he releases, and he makes whole, giving us his strength to walk in his ways. And may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Let us now offer the sacrifice of thanksgiving, the sacrifice of the lips confessing his name. But to do good and to, to distribute, forget not, for with such things God is well pleased. 